This is Remote Ruby. Have you any remote idea to the meaning of the word? What's up? I hit record. Too fast, too furious. Too fast and too furious. Yeah, I'm not changing my opinion that the most recent Fast and Furious was dog water. And I saw someone sum it up very nicely, which I think I sent to you. You sent me a lot of stuff. It's hard to keep up. I know that most people don't read the things I send them, and that's fine. I sent you a clip of Jeff Teague explaining why the last Fast and Furious movie was awful. And it was exactly what I thought just said better. You did send me that. I look at 76% of the things you send me. It's actually a pretty high number. I feel like I'm pretty fair in that regard. I feel honored. It's hit or miss with me. It depends on the person. I feel honored that you'd send it to me. So that's why such a high bar to read it. It's usually like, I need to send this to someone. Who is this most applicable to? <laughs> yeah. 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 You want to like Ruby on? Let's talk Ruby. Ruby. I've been writing Ruby again. Crazy. What does that mean? What month are we in? I guess since end of last year, I've been writing React primarily. Mm-hmm. Life comes at you fast. I know, right? I actually got kind of decent at React to the point where I defended it. I shout out to Diego, our coworker, because I told him at the very front, I was look, I want you to nitpick my code. I want to get better at JavaScript and React. I'm going to ask you a lot of questions. And he did a great job of helping me through and understanding a lot of things. And at the end of it, I felt a lot better about our React, but it's just React in general. Tell me about a time you've defended React. I defended a React to another coworker of ours who will remain nameless. Because of the way we have things set up, I was defending a certain pattern that had been implemented. And the other person did not agree and thought it made things more complicated. But I thought that once you understood it, it was kind of beautiful. Oh, I didn't realize that Lynn had such strong opinions about React. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Lynn's our COO. That's a really bad inside joke. All right. So you're writing Ruby again. I am writing Ruby. I'm working with APIs. and We can't talk about what APIs, can we? I'm not going to talk about what API, but I came to this realization yesterday while I was beating my desk and Diogo was holding his head in his hands and I was just spinning around in a circle. Do we not understand OAuth 2? Or what? Because I don't really understand. Because I thought I understood it perfectly. I was reading the the actual docs for it the other day. I understand it. But then it didn't appear that we did understand it. Because a day later, we realized that this thing we were trying to do, we were basically trying to like authenticate the user again. Even though the way the OAuth integration had worked, it had already done the things that we were trying to do. How does this freaking gem even work? And I still don't really understand how all the OmniAuth gems work, but the one we're using doesn't have any tests. So I feel good about that. That's why I'm team no auth. Yeah. I would rather them have to swipe their driver's license before getting on the app. Do you think that would be easier than no auth? I think that's something a lot of companies are having to consider right now. Interesting. I don't know about you, but I'm personally, anytime someone's like, oh, we should save this information about the user in our database. I'm like, what if we didn't? How about no? Listen, the first, we'll call it product that I really tried hard on to make a success was basically just one big app for storing personal information. And the greatest moment of that year was when I got to drop that database. And it was even all encrypted and it still scared the hell out of me. It scared me one, somebody would get into it, but then it scared me also that I would screw something up and lose the key to decrypt it and then lock the whole thing up. So you just reminded me of something. This is a public service announcement. If you offer API keys to use your API, so I have an application, you can use the API of my application with an authorization token. Please, please, please create a way to make more than one authorization token. I use an app and the app, the whole thing is API based. You only basically use it via API and they only have one token for it. And I have that token everywhere, dude. 
and oh, yeah. I'm paranoid. Because I'm yeah. using it in Obsidian, I'm using it on all these other integrations that have to use it. It's and what all happens the same when token. you you need to roll it, and then you broke in. Everything is, and things. yeah, and then I won't know where the issue occurred, where it leaked. Yeah, like what yeah. was the point of failure? Yeah, yeah. If only Chris were here, give us his thoughts. Oh, hello. I'm enjoying the conversation. I'm just a live listener at this point. We talked about tests for 20 minutes and then realized we should have already been recording. So, oh, yeah. You could probably talk about tests for another 20 hours if you wanted to. That's how long it takes to run our test. No, it mm. doesn't. I know. Have you considered that- just deleting the slow ones? Here we go. The tests are not oh. that slow compared to a lot of apps I have seen. The majority. But they're still slow. I've seen over 10. I feel like for an application this size, I'm talking about like an enterprise application. Actually, I've seen way more than 10. Why did I say 10? I forgot there was at least 10 at one I've seen job. dozens. <laughs> I've seen <laughs> trillions. I worked at a place where the tests would take 36 hours to run Jeez. locally. So... Woo! If you don't run ours in parallel, I bet it takes probably a little over an hour. How many, we don't run how many tests is that? Is that including system tests or not? That's excluding system tests, but our system test isn't near as expansive as our unit test. Yeah. Our test ratio is really high for surprisingly like high. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and. Compared to my zero. Let me run that real stats while we're chatting. This episode, you'll start your test suite and then our episode will end the second the test suite ends. <laughs> Our what if that was our test timer? ratio is 1 to 0. 0.9. I feel like that's very good. That is really good. Yeah. That's what you want. And you don't want to go like overboard on it. Where like sometimes I've seen 120% coverage or something. That's really tested. Are you like just duplicating tests? Testing the same stuff all the time? One of the test suites that I saw a long time ago at a previous job, all of the system tests would do the same authentication steps. So the test suite was really slow because it would always visit the login page, type in the username and password, click submit, and then navigate to the page they were trying to test. And it's little things like that that sometimes make your test suite far slower than it needs to be. You could have just set a cookie or skip that normally or whatever, and then wrote one or two tests for making sure that authentication stuff works with success and without or whatever and you can find those gotchas sometimes especially when you got a big team contributing tests and you copy a test someone else wrote to do your new tweaks for whatever and then oh well we didn't actually need to evaluate all the exact same stuff testing is an art in and of itself i'm a picasso in that regard it's awful just throw stuff everywhere i'm and whatever ma- and then make money the reason we were talking about this is that over the past couple of weeks, it just kind of started to build where people would commit, open a PR, all the specs would run in CI, everything was green. They would deploy, everything was green. Sometimes it might fail in main randomly. Locally, it always, somebody would catch, oh, this is failing always locally. This is really odd. We should probably look at this, but it just kept getting worse and worse. So... Yesterday, my coworker Mario was like, I can't do this anymore. And so we went and traced it down. What was happening was, so we used Knapsack Pro. Knapsack Pro is a service that will take our specs. And if you use parallelization, it'll basically give you a queue of your test. And you can either do it by file or by like test itself in the file. And the benefit to that is basically every time a test finish, it asks, what's the next one I need? And Knapsack's responsible for giving that out. So that way, if you divide it by file, one file might take five minutes and another one might take five seconds. So parallelization doesn't work as evenly then. There's an RSpec setting that changed that we did not catch. I think it's that in combination with using an outdated version of the Knapsack gem. I don't really know what, it's somewhere in here. That would cause these specs just to not run. So it's not that they were actually passing in CI. 
It's just that they would get dropped along the way somewhere. And so we made that change and it started working. And then all of a sudden I've been obsessed about Test for the last few days and working to clean them up. And I've been obsessed with Test for the past two weeks. But before that, probably two months before that, I was obsessed with them again. So that's what we chatting. Things were getting testy. We'll put it that way. Very mm-hmm. testy. Big testy. Did you guys see, was it DHH tweeted a day or two ago about not running CI anymore and running it locally? Instead? Yeah. That, I saw that they added a GitHub actions template to the Brails 8. Yeah. Which is funny because then they're not going to use that anymore, I guess. <laughs> I'm sure it'll stay um, in Rails, but yeah, I guess they won't use it. How do you feel about that? Because like you just said, there are situations where it doesn't run locally, but it passes in CI or vice versa. Is the gut check of here's a brand new Ubuntu image that we install the packages on kind of like our production images. Is that helpful? Does that catch things that you wouldn't when running your tests locally. So when we spin up something on like GitHub Actions or something or... Yeah, because I'm just thinking about how many hours I've wasted trying to configure CI to operate like my local test suite or whatever and the amount of wasted time. But I don't know if the payoff is there because I don't know if it actually catches anything that wasn't reproducible locally. And it's still not production. Right, and it's still different, yes. So like Docker, you were just literally talking about how much you hate Docker, but we'll no, come back I to know, that in a but... second. We'll come back to that. Hold on. Let uh, him cook. Let me cook. No, nah, man, my dishwasher's broken. I ain't cooking anything right now. You uh, don't cook with your dishwasher. How do you make potato salad? Then? Let him cook. Mm. <laughs> let yeah, him... I put my eggs in there and let the hot water. Just steam them. Yeah. Just a little <laughs> waterproof basket. <laughs> this is how we do soft boiled eggs in my house. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh there's an advantage of ci in that for us i can run our test suite in parallel locally in about six to seven minutes but i also have an m1 max and using parallel tests because we use our spec we can't use the rails parallel testing takes freaking all 10 of my cores actually 11 because it kills me to the core too so when we joined this Zoom call, I couldn't even connect my microphone because I was running specs. So I don't want to run my specs every time. There is something yeah. amiss. Um, I don't know what it is. I'm very deep into Rails plugins at the moment because my conference talk next week is on that. You sounded plugged into it. I don't know as much about my main Rails application because I will use one or the next version of Ruby or the next version of Rails. And I can make a branch for Rails and a branch to test Ruby, but something like the PageM having CI able to spin up four different versions of Ruby, four different versions of Rails, four different databases to test against, that is nice. Because I don't really want to test against all that stuff locally. I just want to be pretty confident that it's going to pass all those and then push it up and then let it do all the parallel testing of all the databases and all the things. In that case, incredibly valuable super duper love that but i don't know how many times that unless it's ci for sort of we got jumpstart pro testing against rails 7 2 and we could just have that branch be updated periodically or something by ci and i don't have to go manually do it it could be useful but there's definitely for my main application a lot of times where i'm like eh I have my stuff. I got Ruby 3.3. I got Rails 7.1. I don't have a lot of variation. So if it's running here, typically it's going to run the same in CI and in production because the versions of those things are not different. So maybe there are underlying package versions of libvips or something maybe that's a little different. But But you can set that up wrong on CI too, right? It could pass CI, go to production, and... That goes back to Andrew's point of Docker. I struggle with Docker. I want containers in general. I want to use them. I want to like them. I struggle. If debugging wasn't so bad, if you could give me a binding IRB into that when it fails, then maybe I would be a lot more happy with it. But there was 
I forget what. I had a little Docker file a couple weeks ago. Super simple. Super duper simple. I ran one command in there and it ran as root or something instead of the VS code user or whatever it was, because I think it was for a dev container or something. But yeah, it changed bundle stuff to be owned by root instead of the other user or vice versa. It's just very hard to see the Docker file and then actually understand what literally happened on the machine. And that I find the debugging process is basically the main reason I don't like it. If it was better, then it would be way easier. Because like if I have a machine I can SSH into and I can inspect the whatever file permissions, all that stuff, I can play with the env and check and confirm stuff. I can solve a problem really fast then. But the waiting and reproducing the problem with the change to your Docker file and yeah. spending five, 10 minutes doing whatever is a pain. They finally, after a year, it looks like they have fixed the Intel iMac issue that was a problem. And then finally, Ruby 331 was released with the concurrency fix that has been a problem for a while now. And it was for the Intel Mac thing, it was Tailwind or Node would seg fault. It was last week, I could run my dev container and run Rails test system or Rails test, and it would compile the assets with Tailwind. One in four tries would seg fault inside the Docker container. It wasn't consistent, but one in four times. And they may have fixed it. They've at least fixed it enough where it doesn't fail every single time. But how can I use this? It's unusable for development. So then do I want production to be at similar risk? I don't think so. So it'll be there one day, but I don't know if Podman or some of the old, alter- like Orbstack and those other. Orbstack's you know, great and it's faster, but it's still the same type of problems. I lost a lot of time trying to convert job orderly into a Docker container I could deploy. Maybe I'm too particular, particular, peculiar. I don't know. I want things a certain way and I can never get it to that same experience that I wanted. But on CI stuff, this is much different from Podia, but job orderly, like it just keeps getting bigger and bigger in terms of code. And I don't run CI still. I just always run my specs locally because they just use mini tests and rails parallel and -hmm. they run in six or seven seconds and it's, almost 2000 assertions. I would just rather do that every time before I deploy than wait for it to spin up a whole Linux box and install everything. Yep. I have been wasting a lot of time recently on GitHub Actions because I talked to Samuel Giddens who worked on the Ruby Gems trusted publishing stuff and it's sweet. So it's a GitHub Action that can use Open ID connect with OAuth to get a token to publish your gem on Ruby Gems. So now, say I merge something into Pay and I'm on my phone and it's kind of important, we should release it right away. You can actually just trigger a GitHub action to do the release for you. So you don't have to be logged into Ruby Gems. You don't have to do 2FA. It's all secure through GitHub actions directly to Ruby Gems. I haven't finished all of the gems to get moved over to this, but I set up the CI GitHub action to run the tests. And then I set up the publish gem action to ask you for a version number. So you can type it in on GitHub actions and say, I'm going to release version 12 of pay. And then it will trigger the CI to make sure all the tests run first before it publishes the gem. And then it will go and update the version file and run bundle to make sure the gem file lock and all the appraisals are updated with the new version and then commit that and then push it to Ruby gems, which is like chef's kiss. It's really cool. You guys saw the Linux XZ vulnerability where the basically some guy spent a few years social engineering his way into a Linux package and then like in a binary thing, put his vulnerability in there. <laughs> Kudos. It's nuts. But it could have basically compromised every Linux install, potentially. And if someone didn't notice that it was slower than it was supposed to be, (laughs) crazy. But one of the things Samuel was telling me was the really cool thing about, in theory, using 
the stuff is that we can have reproducible builds. So when you publish code from your GitHub repo or something, we know that it used this Docker image and this version of that Docker image and these packages and those versions of those packages. And it ran the tests and it built the code. And that was what got pushed up and can be verified and reproducible. So someone couldn't inject their own little thing into it. In theory, like we'll have much, much more secure packages and libraries like that going forward. I don't know about you guys, but I bundle install and I don't read the source code of the packages that get downloaded. I just use them. And if they work, they work. But I'm not analyzing that to see if it was compromised ever. And that's one of the crazy things that we just kind of take for granted these days. And it's a little insane where that lacks about it. I wouldn't say lazy, but it's sort of laziness. It's a lot of extra work to go validate all that stuff. But I'm pretty excited to see like that direction of additional proof and sort of the container stuff in theory helps with that where it's, yeah, we know it was this version of Ubuntu and we know that that's trustworthy. So in theory, what happened was all trustworthy too, but things are complicated. Yo, quick question for you. Do you want higher clarity into production, but don't have the time to become a wizard in observability? Honey Badger Insights is exactly what you need. Forget the old school trio of logs, metrics, and traces. We're talking structured events that don't just sit there. They're your treasure map to solving mysteries in your app. With Honey Badger, sling your logs and events into the mix and voila, you just unlock the power of Honey Badger's new query language, Badger QL. It's like having a conversation with your data. Ask it anything, turn mishaps into metrics, and showcase your wins on dashboards that even the marketing team will drool over. And guess what? This isn't just for big spenders. Honey Badger's got you covered with a free plan that packs a punch, including error tracking, uptime monitoring, sleek status pages, and more. Oh, and speaking of errors, Honey Badger treats them like VIPs at the club. With Insights and Badger QL, your errors aren't just problems, they're opportunities. Explore your data in ways you didn't think were possible and get the insights that you deserve. Check out HoneyBadger.io. That's right, HoneyBadger.io. Andrew, what are your thoughts? I agree. Things are complicated. And yeah, I think that dinosaurs are not real. But are you know what is real? Orb stack. Because I tried to get Docker working locally this week to try to run GitHub Actions locally, which was just the biggest mistake I could have possibly made because I think I actually screwed up my computer trying to get Docker working. But... It just kind of reminded me that containerization is a really great pattern. I love containerization. It gives us a lot of power, being able to catch a lot of these inconsistencies with production and development. But Docker just ain't it. Orbstack's Mac only, isn't it? I believe so. Oh, and it costs money for commercial use. Interesting. So does Docker. Ever since well, the M1s yeah. came out, Docker just has not worked well for me. It's also an insane problem to try and solve. It's also insane to me that Microsoft has effectively ported Linux to run natively on Windows. That's a crazy amount of effort and work to do to make that possible. And like building VirtualBox blows my mind a bit. You're running these VMs and simulating hardware and all that stuff. Pretty freaking cool. You can think of video game console emulators as the same thing. But even then, it's not like we can emulate the PlayStation 3 and its cell processor even to this day super well. It's kind of crazy. Just the amount of engineering going into this sort of translation layer from one system to another. What's the one that Apple did with the silicon? Rosetta? Rosetta, yeah. That's not the first time they've done that because you think they went from PowerPC to Intel. Oh, right. Yeah. I can't remember what that was called. Oh, man. You're dating yourself, though. What's a PC? What's power? Yeah, that's a great point. It's just kind of insane how that stuff is even remotely performant at all. It's crazy. And here we are, Ruby developers, making 200 plus millisecond responses with our N plus one queries. (laughs) I had a crazy idea. And I was too scared to tweet it. 
because I was scared of the judgment. Uh, then Sorry. put it on the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Genius. I still call it tweeting. I have this thing I want to do. So, pagey for pagination, this beautiful thing that we all learned about probably from Go Rails. And whenever someone tries to like SQL inject pagination, it raises this pagey variable error. Drives uh, me nuts. Okay. Because I kind of wish that it was automatically. People love setting up bots to try and do that on popular job boards on job boardly. And I want to probably using like rack attack or something similar, basically just block these sites or rate limit them when that error is raised. I have an idea. What if we reverse attack them? So if they attack you, then you kick off a DDoS attack at their IP address. It was just a circular yeah. attack. It's yeah. brilliant. We call those tornadoes, hurricanes. We could come up with some cool branding for that. Eye for an eye. So I want to do something like this only when this error is raised. Probably this could just be solved by like rate limiting, but that's just not how my mind works. Here's where I'm going. So first I'm like, I'll put in rack attack. But then to use reading from certain things require Redis. And I don't use Redis anymore because I use solid Q and I use solid solid, solid cache. cache. Yeah. What if I use solid caching for rack attack in place of Redis? Am I an idiot? Excuse me. Am I an idiot because of that? I don't think so. Unless there are heavy writes or something that might happen. One of the things that I've seen with solid Q and maybe even solid cache is consider sometimes a separate database for that. Just so you right. get hit with a bunch of DDoS attacks and then you take down your production database on accident because you're writing all these things to it. That's the main concern I would probably have with that. I don't know if it's a problem or not, but something to consider. I also had an idea after talking with Cody Norman about his RailsConf talk, and there's a service called Lob. So what you could do as well, you could take the attacker's IP address, reverse geocode it, so you get their home address, and then you can send them a postcard that says, please stop attacking Jawboardly using Lob's <laughs> print and mail API. So like at least in a few days, they would be able to they would have a change Stop of heart. Stop attacking you. It's a very personal touch. And you can have your Jason signed Jason Charn's signature on there and everything. The other thing I was thinking about that service for was an alternative for two-factor auth. We'll send you a postcard and you can log in in three days. It's a rate-limiting service if you think about it. Yeah, rate-limiting as a service. As a yeah, old, physical old rate timing limiting. service. Yeah. You have a bouncer show up at someone's house. Yeah, you can hire these people off Craigslist. You can automate your Craigslist posts and then the payments to those <laughs> random <laughs> Craigslist responses. And eventually That's someone will show up at that person's door. The separate database idea is good because I use managed Postgres on DigitalOcean for job boardly, but I use Hatchbox. So I can just spin up local instance of Postgres for that. And it would be probably a little less latency and maybe a little more fast for uh, that. Potentially, That's a good idea. I'd have to find those discussions, but I was just thinking about at what level of reads and writes or whatever do you need to consider that? It was a pretty hefty number, I think they were talking about in those discussions. So it's also one that what if we just log or graph out when we would do that for the next seven days and see, like, oh, actually, if we were to implement this and write to the database? who do want to have a separate database, or it might be very clear you don't need to do anything custom. It's interesting. That's a good idea. The other thing I've been working with, I'll just ask you because we're on the call. So I use Ahoy, and if you don't use Ahoy, it's a way to track visits and events in your Rails apps, and it's by the god of Ruby Gems, Andrew Kane. And it's one of the first things I set up and it's just been silently working for the last few years. And now I want to start geocoding those requests. I have some people who point an Apex domain. We're trying to fix this, but directly at the job boardly DigitalOcean server. And mm -hmm. 
those are fine. But then I have them come from other places. And I guess caddy is like a security mechanism because it can be yes. spoofed, throws out, forwarded for. Yep. And so I don't actually so have you can, their IP again. You can set up, they have a trusted proxies configuration option. If you have them going to Cloudflare or something, Cloudflare would forward the X forwarded for to caddy. And we do this automatically in Hatchbox, but you have to tell caddy that Cloudflare's IPs trusted. are trusted. And then it will keep the X forwarded for. But yeah, it is a protection for that. And the same thing in the new 2.7, we end up being the reason that they changed the on-demand SSL certificates to actually ask a service like your Rails app if that domain is approved or not. Oh, wow. So then that way you don't accidentally get people adding their domain and then spamming let's encrypt or whatever. And so there's actually now like a little dependency on there of you do need to add your domain so that Caddy can trust it and attempt to do an SSL cert, which is a good thing. I used to just display like there's a vulnerability potentially or whatever, I guess. But that was the way they wanted to solve that problem, yeah. which works. But now it's got an extra sort of got to go ask your service first and then intercept that step during the HTTP request. So it's a little extra work. But So if I tell Caddy, these are the trusted range of IP addresses or the specific IP addresses to trust, X forwarded for is going to come through, which means... Do I need to add the same trusted IP addresses to Rails for it to automatically convert that to request IP or remote IP, I mean? Let's see. If you use Cloudflare, they have different header or something for yeah. the real IP. I remember yeah. having to do that Nginx. At least on Hatchbox, I don't think we rewrite that header, but we could, and we probably should. That would be handy. problem I have is not all my requests go through Cloudflare. because that Yeah, was some people go directly... So direct. And I want to. But then it would be your IP address, right? So you wouldn't have an X forwarded for if the DNS right. went directly to your service. Right. That's true. Yeah. So, yeah. If you need to access the original IP address, I'd have to look at the Cloudflare docs to remember that header. I but saw that one. You can also, since we have the routing array JSON that's configurable. Right now, we don't have anything to rewrite that header, but we can build that into Hatchbox automatically because so many people use Cloudflare. But you can also currently, before we do that, add your own little rewrite thing what you in and there. I did for yeah. SAS custom domain. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot about that. That's the problem I have right now is I have my DNS. People come to job lawyer from three different places. I have Apex domains point to the IP address. I recommended for a long time people use C names, which points domains.jobboardly, which points then to the yeah. server. And then I have some people then who go through SAS custom domains. I'm trying to migrate everyone there because then I'll just have one set of IPs yep. Yep. to let through. So, And I can't remember, do requests go through his service, the SAS custom domains, and yeah, then they, they go to your... Cloudflare, and then they go to your Rails app? They, they point to my host, yeah. So much like... Or they skip Cloudflare in that case? Go right yeah, to your I, IP? I, I don't proxy it, yeah. I just come on through. Mm -hmm. I could, if everyone went through me, then I could proxy and I could have even more control that way too. Yeah. I was just thinking about DDoS protection and it's possible you still want to do that. So your public IP is not exposed. But he may use that on his, and if their domain points to his IPs, it might actually be Cloudflare's like IPs there, Yeah, which I would assume a service like that would want to implement or something. That's a good question, though, Yeah, and to get an answer for. This is the fun stuff that you don't really ever get into in development at all because you just go straight to the Rails app in your browser yep. locally, and you're not going through DNS, you're not going through SSL, like none of that. and they're not things you can really prepare for. And then when you do run into them, they're also the slow propagating things yes. that are very, very hard to test because the same reason with Docker is there's no debugging step. There's no like, here's a history of the request and how it got mutated by 
SaaS custom domains and then by Cloudflare and then by Caddy and then it shows up in Rails. Request happened, it made it to Rails, but we don't really know what happened in those steps in between. There's a reason for that. It is great to implement caching layers in between so it can say, hey, we don't even need to go to Rails because we got the file here in the CDN and we can just send it back. But it is another one of those things where debugging is very hard because of that invisible nature of things. And it's something that not every SaaS app will have either. Like it's when you start getting into stuff where you host stuff on behalf of other people who want to point their domains there. I really like working on job worthy. And at times I think it'd be so cool to implement a feature and not have to build it for a front end and a back end. Cause I do that at work all day. You can build a website. And so then that means we have to have a back end for our customers to manage their website. Man. Yeah. People with SaaS apps or just applications that just serve a utility, so badass. I (laughs) I envy you. Yeah, it is interesting because you probably at a certain point have three layers of you need your own customer support backend for Podi itself. So not only do you have the customer facing thing, you have the marketplace admin area and then your own Podi admin. And whenever you are asked to build a feature, you have to do it three times. Pretty funny, but it is how it goes, unfortunately. That's an interesting thing. I was playing with the Mad Men gem yesterday. When you brought up Pagey, I actually was thinking of that because I fixed a bug in Mad Men that Pagey 8 had changed one of the variable names for the rendering of the links. We'd taken the HTML ERB template and the logic in there and had just applied Tailwind CSS directly to the tags or whatever. So that changed in version eight. And I've set up Madbin because as long as you use page three or higher, there haven't been any breaking changes until now. But of course, now that we have our own custom template, it messed up. But the page nav front end helper is going to have the same arguments and is very unlikely to change. So I just removed our thing and then did a little CSS snippet in the head because we're using Tailwind from the CDN. We can have a build step in the gem that when you release the gem, we could go take Tailwind, go generate the CSS file, and then bake it into the release as an option. But out of sort of simplicity, what if we just throw the CDN in here and let it do its thing on page load? It's so much simpler for now, at least. And I think Adrian may use Tailwind for the Avo gem. And I think he does that same build step or whatever for releasing it. But I'm also holding out a little bit because I know Prop Shaft is coming as the default here in Rails 8. Did you see the article, the interview with Raphael? It sounds like Rails 7.2 comes out next month. The article was published yesterday. The interview with him that was super good. I got it here in my chat. I'll grab that link and share that in the show notes. Somebody on Twitter had asked, are we going to go straight to Rails 8? That was me, I think. Oh, Because I saw DHH push a change to Rails that was basically like, we're going to use Ruby 3.3 on new Rails apps, which removed the error highlight gem, which I don't think is even necessary anymore anyways, because Ruby 3.1 got the error highlight gem built in or something. He was removing that or something. Well, I tweeted that. The commit message said Rails 8, and I was, hmm, does that mean that we are going straight to Rails 8? Because there's still quite a few open tickets or issues on Rails 7.2, uh, the milestone there. And then there's the Rails 8 milestone, which has things like the action notifier stuff and big projects. But it still sounds like they're planning to do a release at the end of May or early June. And then I think that roughly hits the six-month deadline that they're hoping to do after Rails World and before the next Rails World. That is definitely the target for Rails 8, at least. So I love that we're going to have multiple releases of Rails a year because, man, there are bug fixes in there for so long. And if we could get them sooner, we could upgrade our code sooner. There are so many little things in Jumpstart targeting the next Rails version, and I just can't use that stuff. There was the 
bundler Ruby file option where you can say that read the Ruby version from the dot Ruby version file. Oh, nice. Can't use that because Heroku doesn't support that version of bundler yet. And so it was February when that finally got updated. But it just sucks because I want to use the new stuff. It's cleaner. It's simpler. It's got bug fixes and whatever else. Maybe it's faster. And if I can't use it right away, it's frustrating because then you have to wait a year or something. And it's definitely been at least a couple years for releases and things. It's a weird situation still, I think, that Hotwire is sort of separate from Rails core. And so coordinating those releases with Rails itself. You think it'll always be that way? I hope not. It feels weird for it to be separate. It really does. It's not a Rails-only framework, though, so I understand the separation or the intention of that, at least. But there are not a regular cadence on that, and it has historically been worse than Rails because there are less people working on it. And we don't have someone like Raphael who's always kind of maintaining the pull requests and issues and the other contributors and triagers and all that stuff. There's less activity on it, which just means some things that have rough edges may have a pull request or five pull requests or something outstanding for a couple of years. Then it's, do we use the workarounds for now? What is the official way to do this? Because what if I pick a workaround that is actually totally different than the official thing that ends up getting merged later, then I got to undo all my code and then do it the new way and then waste time doing that for not a lot of benefit because I had built the feature already or something. I'm hoping that that starts to get ironed out and it seems like the direction they're working towards, but just wish we had the cadence sooner than later. Yeah. Interesting seeing Brian Castle talk about all the problems oh, yeah. he keeps running into using Turbo. Yeah, and the one that he just posted, or whatever he was doing, the some of the head tags ended up in the body, which seemed weird. But it's also not stated anywhere, as far as I know. Like, don't use a turbo frame in your head tag, which he had done and caused that weirdness. Yeah, it'd be great to document that. But I'd also like to see his example and his use case so that that could be used as oh, this is inspiration for maybe we need to add a new feature to Turbo to support things like that. Or maybe it's just a misunderstanding and like, yeah, you shouldn't ever do it that way. And we should have some other documentation saying, don't do this or whatever. But it's not bad like it was in the Turbolinks days, but it is still very far from sort of completeness and stuff. And I still feel like there are abstractions that are missing in stimulus and stuff. And there are often times where I still wish I could just do the Alpine way of have my toggle logic just in the DOM and no JavaScript because my components that simple or even like a modal and a button to really need to have a component that has a open method that calls open dialogue because it could just do it in line or something, and maybe we'll end up with a version like that at some point. But at the moment, I don't think that's compatible with the philosophy or whatever. We're not enough examples of, yeah, this would be easier, and we agree we should merge something like that. It probably needs examples or something. You said Alpine, and it reminded me, I saw a tweet, or whatever you call it these days. I don't remember who it was, but it was basically a sampling of different sites and how accessible they are in terms of like passing accessibility standards. React scored very high because a lot of people use components that are a lot of time and effort's going to. This isn't necessarily fair to say, but Rails scored pretty low in terms of, because the way they did that was by looking for stimulus. Right. And it reminded me then of something that we haven't talked about. I don't think we've talked about it on here. Web Awesome. The new web component library, which was basically Shoelace before we've had Connor on. Shoelace, my understanding, got acquired by Font Awesome. And then now they just finished a Kickstarter campaign that raised $700,000 to build these web components that are 
customizable, reusable, and it's going to be made by the same person who did shoelaces. I think it's Corey who did that. I remember his last name, but I backed it as soon as I saw it. I am so excited for that. I can't remember if I backed it. I was getting emails about it, so I think I did. I don't remember. I got lost in going to Australia, and I don't know if I did back it or not, but whatever. Even if I didn't, then I will be buying it afterwards. That is really awesome stuff, and I think that I really like web components and sort of the organization of how it handles things, but there are those really hard parts of how do you add a callback to a feature of a web component or whatever? And hopefully they're working towards making that stuff easy. Because I remember using like the Ninja Keys repository, which is a web component, but you've got to set up a JavaScript tag that grabs the thing out of the DOM and then add some properties to it to set up your own callbacks. And it just felt a little wonky. It's kind of one of those where I wish that there was a bit cohesiveness to it or something. I don't know how to explain it really, but there's some ergonomics to it that didn't feel quite right yet. Maybe that's the long-term thing because right now I feel like the problem with stimulus is it's just the JavaScript. We don't care what your HTML is. You can apply it to anything, but HTML really matters to how your JavaScript is going to work. It assumes these things exist and they visually need to be looking like a certain thing. And so it's sort of the Stimulus is just the JavaScript and says, hey, we have no say or anything about the HTML and the style for it. Really, when we want components, we want it all. It really, all of it matters. That's why the React components are great. Like Adam Lathen was talking to us whenever that was about React is really the only thing with proper accessibility. Nothing else even comes close. And I want all of my components to be fully accessible, but I got to go do all that myself, which is why React is pretty great. But we don't have any other options. And maybe this web awesome components will be able to provide the accessibility and bridge that gap without having to go React. And you could use this in your turbo applications because that's the benefit of this stuff is it's just an element on the page. So it knows the same things that your stimulus controllers know when it was added or removed to the DOM it knows to set up the events and how to handle them automatically. And it's not related to a framework of JavaScript being loaded. It's independent little components that understand how they're supposed to operate. So I'm hoping this is a good step forward. We should get Corey and Connor to come on and talk about yeah. this. Yes. Big I'm yes. Gonna, I'm going to message right now. Which is funny because I'm going to land this plane. And at takeoff, Andrew. Was oh, did talking. your test suite finish? We're talking about takeoff. A lot of things here. So when we started this episode, before you had a chance to join, Andrew was talking about how he's defended React recently, and we're ending it by Chris saying, "And I quote, and React is great." That's the title of the episode. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good to be back with y'all. Yeah, doing whatever the hell we do. I'm going to miss you guys at RailsConf next week. Oh, yeah, it is next week. I'm already sad that you won't be there. Me and Andrew will be together the week after. Playing paintball. I ain't playing paintball. Oh, yeah. Going up to Burlington, I heard. Burlington, the coat factory. Yep. Yep. So we went up to Burlington a couple years ago to start our Mini Cooper road trip and go down to North Carolina or whatever. But I was calling it the... The Burlington Cheese Coat Factory or something. (laughs) I'm sure she loved that. She was seven months pregnant in a Mini Cooper for two weeks. So, Ain't no way. Say less. Yep. Ain't no way. Shout out, Brooke. (laughs) Always. Brooke has a forever shout out. True debt. All right. See ya. Bye. Bye.